My name is Brittany Tate and I'm the Education Coordinator for the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance. Um, I started working with the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance about five years ago as an AmeriCorps member and over time I developed the education program and found myself as the Education Coordinator and started developing programs with the school districts here in the area and uh, developed a grasses and classes curriculum and then also now a middle school curriculum known as Dunes and Schools. Um, so that's how I've found myself working uh, with the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance. The Choctahatchee Basin Alliance uh, is a nonprofit watershed organization. Uh, so if all of our programs rely heavily on grant and donor funded support, uh, so we're always writing grants and looking for support uh, to keep programs like grasses and classes going for all these students because we want to um, continue to educate uh, the students here in Okaloosa County. Um, the goal of CBA is to provide optimal utilization of the Choctahatchee Bay watershed. Uh, so back in the 90s, the organization was started as part of Northwest Florida State College's foundation, and that's uh, still where we under-operate from. So we're out of the uh, South Walton Center, and uh, our goal is really just uh, to promote the, uh, you know, the proper use of our waterways here and just to help as we can. So we focus in four different program areas. We focus in uh, restoration, monitoring, education, and research. So the four, those are the four arms that Choctahatchee Basin Alliance focuses on. So um, research, uh, we just help other um, universities, organizations, and provide them with manpower, any support they may need. Uh, but we really focus heavily in monitoring, restoration, and education. So monitoring is originally why we were created, to do water quality monitoring of our local watershed. Uh, so we, have, we sample over 100 sites uh, throughout every month and it's in partnership with Florida Lake Watch and, and with volunteers. It's a solely volunteer run uh, program. So volunteers go out every month and they collect uh, water quality on the river, in the Chattahoochee Bay, of the coastal dune lakes, and out in the Gulf. So uh, we're always constantly collecting water quality um, monitoring data. We also monitor our oyster reefs, and our oyster reefs is a big component of our restoration arm. So restoration, we do a lot of shoreline restoration, so by building these oyster reefs um, to help with um, oyster settling, it's also really good uh, natural breakwater, so you're going to have uh, a reduced amount of erosion, and that's also when we come in with our smooth core grass and we plant behind it. Uh, so restoration, that's a big component. We also in, uh, help with invasive and exotic uh, species removal. So. Uh, we do a lot of that kind of work. We have a program right now called Habitat RX where we go and we remove invasive species and help the homeowners and um, sites uh, get native plants there. So that's a big part of our restoration effort. And then education. And education is really just getting into the school districts and local libraries and getting the community and children aware of our natural resources. So uh, that's really the goal of Chattahoochee Basin Alliance is uh, to get people aware and to promote the optimum utilization of the Choctahatchee Bay watershed. So about six years ago, uh, the Choctahatchee Basin Alliance started partnering with Northwest Florida State College's AmeriCorps program. And with that partnership, it's really grown into something uh, great. So grasses and classes would not be sustainable and would not be able to uh, be implemented in the way that it is without AmeriCorps' help. So uh, this AmeriCorps program is called Northwest Florida's Environmental Stewards and there are 13 AmeriCorps members and they are part of an education team. My name is Joshua Castle. Uh, I just graduated from Choctahatchee High School um, two years ago, class of 2013. I'm from Fort Walton, Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Um, I'm a nursing student, just got accepted to nursing and I started AmeriCorps right out of high school. Uh, my name is Anne Marie and my background is in music performance um, I was studying vocal performance before I joined AmeriCorps. Um, I don't really have any experience with education outside of AmeriCorps, and I never really saw that as a track that I would enjoy, but through my experience with um, implementing grasses and classes, the curriculum through the third and fifth graders over the last two years, um, it's really been an engaging experience and kind of um, brought to light how, how fun it is to kind of see that spark, see the, see the children um, really um, enjoy science. What exposed me to AmeriCorps was um, one of my friend's mothers actually teaches at the college and she saw AmeriCorps at a job fair and so she told me about it and told me that the focus was on environmental and they were in partnership with CBA. So I said I, I love environmental, I love being outside, I love going camping, I like going surfing, I just love being outdoors. So I said well maybe this might be something for me and it involves children 
pretty good with kids, so it just kind of drew me in, and I wanted to start to serve my community as well. It's because I was looking at Peace Corps as well, but this is kind of like the step before that, so. Well, I was living in Austin, Texas, and uh, a good friend's mom had been a member of AmeriCorps in years previous. And she uh, had spoken to me about the program because we were speaking about science. She was rewiring her daughter's house that I was living in at the time. And um, it, she talked to me about the AmeriCorps program here and said that it was an environmental science program teaching uh, students and working on restoration projects. I said, wow, that really sounds out of this world. I grew up in this area. This is my hometown. So um, being able to expose um, you know, young students and also be able to take part, an active part in my community and helping um, to restore this land and the water that you know, we all enjoy and people come from all over the place to enjoy is really an incredible opportunity. So I said, okay, I'm gonna look into this AmeriCorps thing. So what they do is every day throughout the month they go to 20 different schools and they go in and they teach these lessons. So uh, CBA provides materials and training and um, support and they are then go out and they're our team. They're the ones that go in and educate all the students. We have about 2,500 students. They're out there educating them every day and, and really making a difference and they're gaining life skills as well. So they're learning not only about the environment, uh, but they're also gaining some teaching skills and developing some networking because uh, AmeriCorps is a uh, part of the National Commission of Service and this AmeriCorps program is part of Volunteer Florida. Um, and so it, they are paid a living stipend and they are also given an education award at the end because it's a, a, kind of like a paid internship. It's a service opportunity for these um, individuals that are uh, out here teaching uh, the students. So they're getting life skills and they're really developing some networking in hopes that they'll either go back to school or use that money to pay back student loans or um, go and get their uh, master's degree. So, um, it's really a good program. There's AmeriCorps throughout uh, the state and throughout the nation. It's often referred to as the Domestic Peace Corps. Uh, so we really rely on that AmeriCorps partnership uh, and so that we can go out and we teach all these uh, students in a place-based program. So when I was working with AmeriCorps, CBA approached me and I was a returning AmeriCorps member. And the idea for CBA was they really and truly believe that uh, to improve uh, our uses of natural resources in the area, it starts by inspiring the youth. And so through that, we thought education and information about our local waterways was the way to go. So uh, we developed a curriculum around uh, a plant called Spartina alterniflora, or smooth cordgrass. And the idea is that students grow that in their classroom uh, that will eventually be placed along the shorelines and help with shoreline restoration. And so when I started working on the curriculum, that idea was already in place. Schools were growing smooth cord grass in their classrooms and then going on these end of the year field trips. But there was nothing in the middle, to really no substance there to give these students an idea of why they're doing it and what, what's the importance behind it. Really, they didn't have the investment that needed to be there. So what we did is we tried to fill those gaps with uh, hands-on activities and lessons so each lesson builds upon these ideas about the importance of smooth cord grass. So the students uh, learn that Spartina alternal flora does three things. It helps to filter uh, stormwater runoff, so it helps to absorb any pollutants um, that may come down to the water through stormwater runoff. It helps to stop and prevent erosion with their strong roots, so if any big boat wake or waves come on shore, uh, it helps keep that land there with their strong roots. And then it also provides a critical intertidal habitat. Uh, for small juvenile species. So each lesson kind of builds on those ideas. Um, and to make it important and useful for the school districts here, we worked with school officials and administration and teachers to make sure that that curriculum was aligned to state standards. So we're always making sure that that curriculum is up to date uh, with the new standards and the new benchmarks that are being implemented in the classroom. Uh, so now the students uh, that participate in grasses and classes grow the smooth core grass. They start doing that in October and they have salt marsh nurseries at their school and they keep the grasses there, about 500 plants per school. And then after that, from October till April, they get in classroom instruction. So it's all hands-on. We bring in microscopes, bring in other scientific tools so that they can start getting familiar with those. Um, and then they just build upon that and in May they go on a field trip uh, to plant their grass along the shoreline. We are implementing in 15 Okaloosa County schools and five Walton County schools this year for grasses and classes. 
So what we do is all throughout May, every single day in the month of May, we have field trips. And this is uh, you know, the project celebration. It's accumulation of all the things they have learned. So they actually get to go out into the field and learn and see what they've been studying all year. So we have gone and picked up the smooth core grass that they've been growing. And today they're going to come down here and they're going to plant that smooth core grass. So today, Edge Elementary School is going to be joining us, all of their fifth graders. So about four classes of fifth graders are gonna be uh, joining us here at Florida Park and they're going to be participating in their planting. I'm Mary Brown and I'm a fifth grade teacher at Edge Elementary. Um, I work with a fabulous team at a fabulous school and uh, I teach math and science twice a day. I'm Allison from Grasses and Classes, the Choctaw Basin Alliance, um, came to our school and asked if people were interested. And another really great friend of ours, Ann Sisk, was very interested and asked me if I would join her to go learn about it. And uh, we started some nurseries at our school and we've just been loving it ever since. In the beginning of the year, uh, I have to say the Basin Alliance is really great because they start them with a hands-on activity. So the kids right from the start know that this is going to be an active, hands-on situation. And uh, we separate plants and repot our plants on the very first one and get our very first lesson about Sparti Spartina alterniflora, which is a smooth cord grass for this area. And then from then on we talk about salinity levels and we uh, learn about the percentages that the grasses need and we learn about brackish water, our watersheds. Um, all of these are hands-on activities all the way through today where we get to come out and actually plant the plants that we've been growing all year. Oh my gosh, the, uh, you hear, oh my gosh, look, we really are making a difference. Oh, that's so cool. You even hear, oh, that's really gross. But while we're tending them, we see snails that are growing on them. You know, during the nursery time, we get to really go out and tend our plants and, and the kids become invested in that. Uh, so we have six different stations today, and the stations are going to be ran by uh, our AmeriCorps team. Um, and they're the, actually the ones that have been delivering the information. So the kids are very excited to see some of the teachers that they have met and been interacting with all year. So the students are going to arrive, we'll give a short little introduction, and then they'll begin rotating through their stations. So today we have six different activities um, and lessons that they'll interact with. This game is our adaptation game, and what he's explaining right now is um, each student is going to get a cup, which represents their stomach, and they're going to get a beak. And the, they all have three different beaks. So um, they have the spoon-billed billy, and that is a spoon. They have a split-nosed foo-foo, which is chopsticks, and then they have a grabby-grab, which is um, <clears throat> clothespin. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna take those lima beans or red beans, and he's gonna spread it out and they're gonna turn around and they have to collect as many uh, beans, which is their food, as they can uh, in one day. And so he'll say when the sun rises and when the sun sets. And they're gonna see how much they can collect. And so what they're learning is different adaptations um, survive better and are better equipped for certain environments. Um, and then as the game goes on, he makes it more fun. Like he might add in a tornado, so they'll have to take shelter or they have to, uh, you know, all the grabby grabs got a disease and lost one of their legs. So they have to hop on one leg. Um, and so they'll do it over and over again. And uh, what the goal is, is after each night, if they don't get enough food, say 10 beans, uh, then they didn't make it through the night. And so eventually it kind of narrows down to one or two adaptations. And then typically the spoon bill Billy, the spoon is gonna work the best. Um, so he's passing them out and they'll make a big circle and then they'll all try to uh, grab as many beans as they can. At this station, they also get candy, so they really like this game. <laughs> uh, CB and AmeriCorps rely heavily on partnerships, and uh, one of the partners we've uh, recently started working on is uh, with the Okaloosa Science uh, Grant that just was received by uh, the school district. And uh, so here we have some Coast Guard members, uh, and typically we also have Officer Snook program, and what they're doing is they're running our marine debris station and that's really what a big component of the Okaloosa Science Grant is, is focusing on uh, marine debris. So we've provided our marine debris timeline for them to use and kind of run a station for us. And uh, so what they have in front of them is a timeline that runs from two weeks all the way up to undetermined and they have a bunch of trash. And so the kids will figure out where each 
trash belongs on the timeline. And they'll learn like a diaper takes 450 years in the water to break down and glass jars, it takes so long to break down that uh, no one is sure. So it's an undetermined amount of time. And then monofilament, which is typical fishing line that, you know, that is used throughout, it takes 600 years to break down. So they learn that you know, when they throw a piece of trash in the water here or there, it actually doesn't just disappear overnight. It takes many, many, many years. So uh, they just learn about the different trash that could cause problems in the bay. Uh, so what they've been doing this year is they have uh, been taking care of salt marsh nurseries, which their smooth core grass has grown in. And to do that, uh, they've been using a refractometer. And the refractometer is a tool that measures the amount of salt in your water or the salinity level. Uh, so they've been trying to keep their salt marsh nurseries in a range of 15 to five parts per thousand. And parts per thousand simply is a unit of measurement that is used to measure salinity. So at this station, they get to use those that tool one more time and they get to learn about different animals and how they survive in different salinity levels. So they begin by reviewing what a watershed is. And watershed, uh, no matter where you live in the world, you're part of a watershed. And what that means is water that's not absorbed by the land has to go somewhere. It has to drain to a common point. And so in the area that we've been studying, that common point is the Choctahatchee Bay. So they're focusing on the Choctahatchee Bay watershed. So the Choctahatchee Bay watershed has three different types of water. It has fresh water, salt water, and brackish water. And how you determine what water is what is you look at the salinity level. So if a water is 0 to 0 0.5 parts per thousand, that's considered fresh water. 0 0.5 to around 30 parts per thousand is considered brackish water, which is a mixture of fresh water and salt water. And then salt water is anything above 30 parts per thousand. So in front of each group, they have uh, three different types of water. They have a fresh water sample, a salt water sample, and a brackish water sample. On top of those samples, there are different fish. And so the goal is using their refractometer and the skills they have learned and the knowledge they know about the different types of water, they're gonna use the refractometer and they're gonna test a sample. And uh, whatever the salinity level is, they are going to then place that fish in the correct part of the watershed. So say they take the sample and it is a zero parts per thousand reading, they would take the fish off the top of the sample and they would add it to the river, which is a freshwater system in the Choctahatchee Bay watershed. Uh, so they, got, they have all three samples and three different fish, and so they have to figure out what the sample is, then take that fish and part, put it on the right part of the watershed. At the end of the lesson, they learn about the different types of fish. So they learn, they'll see that a gulf sturgeon, which is an endangered fish that lives in the watershed, actually uh, lives some of its life in the river, in the gulf, and in the bay. So it actually lives in fresh, salt, and brackish water. And so they learn different facts about the different fish that can be found in our local area as well. Okay, so this is our oyster station. At this station, uh, the group is split up into two. And what we're doing is we're just uh, re-hitting on some of the oyster facts that we have learned this year. So an, an adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water in one day. So they're literally learning about the importance of the oyster being a natural uh, water quality filter and learning how they attached to hard surfaces and when they're small they are free floating in the larval stage so they float around looking for a hard place to settle so at this table this is our exploration and touch station so they're seeing different live oysters uh, we also build oyster reefs in the bay it's something that CBA and AmeriCorps do and so there we build those reefs using recycled shell and fossilized shells they get to see the difference in size and shape and weight of those shells um, also, they'll use hard, uh, they'll look at hard surfaces that oysters have landed on. So sometimes you'll see oysters growing on bridge pilings and hard shell in the bay because when they're small, they're free floating. So we have different items that oysters have landed on and started growing. One thing that CBA and AmeriCorps do is they build oyster reefs in the bay. And about four years ago, AmeriCorps, in partnership with CBA, began uh, the Oyster Recycling Program. And what that is, is uh, three times a week, AmeriCorps and CBA go around to local restaurants and they collect shucked oyster shell. Uh, so they go and they collect the shell and then we take them back to uh, our campus and to our work site and we dump them out 
and we let them dry. And they dry at a minimum of six weeks, but we, we use a longer time scale than that. But they uh, dry out in the sun and it takes away any bacteria. And then after that, we uh, move that shell up and we start bagging that shell into mesh bags. And then we place those mesh, mesh bags into the bay and build our reefs. So this game explains that entire process. So what the students do is they uh, pretend they're all the way in the restaurant, they shuck the shell, they remove the oyster, which is just a piece of Play-Doh, uh, and then they shuck their shell. Then they take them to the site and they dump them out, and they then have to turn around six times, holding a sun, which represents the six weeks. After that, they dump them out, and then they begin to create the mesh bags. So they create the mesh bags and then they build a pyramid which is similar to the oyster reef shape that we use in our oyster reefs. So this teaches them about the oyster recycling program and a little bit more about our oyster reef program that we have. So this is our planting station and so this is where they actually get to plant their smooth cork grass. And right now they're working in groups of three and what they're doing is they're working together to create a burlap bag that's filled with uh, sand and three smooth cork grass plants. Uh, so uh, over the years, the CB and AmeriCorps have learned that planting along the shoreline can be pretty difficult because water is always moving around. So plants often get washed away when they're freshly planted because they haven't developed those strong roots to hold on to the shoreline. So to help with that, and uh, we have developed this idea uh, that we are going to use burlap bags. And so what we do is uh, the students, they place one plant um, in the hole, at the farthest hole. The plants are in the burlap bag, they have a triangle shape. and so the they first put in one plant all the way into the farthest hole and then they begin scooping sand. And so they're going to put in 10 scoops of sand for that first hole and they pack it in. We say try to create a big sand pillow. Um, so after that first plant is in, they'll put in their second, put 10 more scoops, and then they'll put in their third plant and then put 10 more scoops. So a total of 30 scoops of sand and then we'll tie those bags off and we'll walk them down to the shore. Um, the burlap bags are really a great tool because it gives those plants um, some time to develop really strong root systems um, and so eventually as those plants are developing those strong roots the bag is biodegradable so it's naturally going to break down in the environment. So around the end of summer what will be left is just uh, the smooth cord grass plants and a restored shoreline and the burlap bags will already be uh, decomposed and broken down. Uh, so this station we just review you know the importance of smooth cord grass that it helps to uh, filter stormwater runoff and absorb any pollutants it helps to prevent erosion with those strong root systems, and then it also provides a inter, uh, critical intertidal habitat. Uh, so this one, they're just working together to create their bag, and then they'll walk it down to the shoreline and place the plants where they will belong the rest of their life. Smooth core grass uh, really helps to prevent erosion and it also provides a habitat and like most salt marsh uh, plants, it helps to slow down runoff and by slowing it down, it helps to absorb and filter any pollutants. Um, so what's happening here is we've had a few field trips and they have uh, made their bags and they have uh, filled them with sand and we've placed them in this style and eventually that bag is gonna break down and all that's gonna be left is a nice uh, restored area. So if you look really close in that corner over there, um, there's some grass that's really lush and very green. That's grass from last year's field trip. And so uh, what's happened is the burlap bag is gone and all that's left is a smooth cord grass. Smooth cord grass grows through a process known as rhizomatic growth, which simply means that new plants can grow off the root systems. And so uh, placing the burlap bags also allows them to spread out and start to grow and so uh, as the summer progresses we'll start seeing new shoots pop up through the burlap bag and eventually that burlap bag will be gone. One thing that the students have learned throughout the year is that uh, smooth cord grass provides a critical intertidal habitat for juvenile species. Uh, so this station uh, not only allows them to see the animals that their smooth cord grass uh, will benefit here at Florida Park, but it also allows them to have fun. As you can see, they're 
using a lot of different tools to catch different fish and different uh, little creatures. Anything of interest, they can add it to the tank. Uh, so they're using little dip nets, a staining square to see if they can filter out any things that might be living in the soil. Um, so they're just having some fun, trying to catch some fish. And then at the end of the station, they'll kind of have a uh, conclusion where they'll talk about the different fish that they have um, caught. When these students leave grasses and classes at the end of their field trip, I hope that they leave with a sense of responsibility, a sense of connection to their local ecology and with um, at least an interest in science. And I think that they do. You know, through growing the, the grasses throughout the year and participating in the lessons, um, I hope that we help to ignite a spark that um, takes them along their journey and that they keep the lessons they learn in grasses and classes, even something as small as um, you know, how plants grow or how to recycle or why it's important to use reusable items. I hope that they carry that along and also share that information, share that um, lesson, that knowledge with their peers, with their parents. It teaches them to, to really care for it and to instill others and to educate. Not, not only are we educating them, it's we're, we're encouraging them to educate their friends, their family, really expose them to the great outdoors. I really hope that they are understanding a stewardship for Earth and for their environment and being responsible for what happens in our environment. And I think this really shows them the importance of nature and, and getting nature back to nature instead of seawalls and things like that. And that they really have a stewardship about their, their environment now. Because it really does take a village, you know, to um, make an impact. So I hope that they continue to hold the enjoyment and interest in their local ecology and world ecology. When the students leave uh, the program and they are done with grasses and classes, we hope that they have um, not only developed an interest in science, but also become aware of the local natural resources and the importance of the Choctahatchee Bay. Um, because what we really want to do through CBA's education program is to develop the next generation of water stewards. So we want them to grow up appreciating the waters um, and enjoying them in a sustainable way.